Hi everyone, my name's Esther. Uh, welcome to Abbey Church Online. Um, this is the first of our Christmassy kind of services. Um, you might have noticed I'm not wearing a Christmas jumper because, to be quite honest, it's way too soon. But tune in next week, maybe I might be. Um, but yeah, we've got loads of good stuff happening over the next week. Loads of Christmas uh, events and services happening online. Um, so it's dead easy for you to get involved with. Do check out our website, social media for more details. Um, next Sunday, we have a reflective service. So that will be, yeah, a little bit quieter and a bit of time to kind of pause in the run up to Christmas. That's next Sunday morning. And next Sunday afternoon at four o'clock, we have... Um, Chris Stingles at home so that is going to be really exciting we'd love to um, see you come along to those and do yeah invite other people it's never been easier to come along to a Christmas service um, you can do it at home wear your pajamas get some mulled wine eat as many mince pies as you want um, do come along and invite your friends um, so this morning we have Patrick Regan. He's from a charity called Kintsugi Hope. He's going to be speaking to us um, about well-being at Christmas. So yeah, we're looking forward to hearing from Patrick later. Um, one other thing that's happening at the moment, we um, usually at the end of a school term, um, we want to encourage our teachers, people who are working in education, and say thank you for the hard work that they're doing. So we often uh, make some cakes and take them into schools. Um, obviously, it's a little bit difficult to do that at the moment, but this Christmas we want to, um, yeah, bless our schools and give them some Christmas hampers. So if you would like to get involved in that, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Either um, donate some food or items to go in the hampers, or you can give us some cash and we will spend it on something really good and tasty. Um, you can find out details for that online. Um, so yeah, that would be really good, won't it? Teachers and people in schools have had, yeah, a tough few, quite a few months. So yeah, we want to encourage them and say thank you for everything that they've been doing. So that is it for now from me. Um, I am going to hand over to Stu and um, yeah, Stu and the band are going to lead us in some worship. Hi everyone, we're going to use some songs now to worship God together. And um, I'm going to start by praying. Um, some of the songs may be familiar to you, some may not be. Uh, but I encourage you to use these words and the melodies to worship God. Let's just pray. Father God, thank you for your presence wherever we are now. Thank you as we sing to you, as we declare who you are. We can relate with you. Your light breaks forth. Your hope rises. Lord, would you do something as we sing and worship that is deeper in our lives? In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> of Bethlehem as still we see thee above thy teeth and dreamless sleep the silent stars go yet in the dark streets shineth the ever Together, proclaim. 
wherever you are, sing great. Great are you, Lord. Even if it's hard. Great are you. thank you that you meet us where we're at right now some of us Lord it's really hard to sing those words to say that you are great but thank you that you meet us where we are Lord, we choose to worship you. Every season, we choose to worship you. With our voices, with our actions, with our heart's desires, with our mind, we choose to worship you. Would you come and fill us by your spirit that your light breaks forth and your hope rises in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So today is uh, the second Sunday in Advent and yeah, we thought it would be good to take a bit of time now to just kind of have a think around that and again in the run up to Christmas it can be really busy and frantic, can't it? So um, what we're going to do is we are going to use um, an app um, made by 24-7 Prayer, it's called Lectio 365. They have a daily app, it's really, really good, really recommend it. Um, And yeah, we're going to basically go through that. And what they do is they use the word pray and they, um, yeah, kind of use that to help us pray, which is quite handy, isn't it? Um, So P stands for pausing. So it's pausing to be still. Um, R is for rejoicing. And A is asking and Y is yielding. So we're going to kind of go through that pattern now. There'll be a bit of space to... Um, pause and reflect and to pray um, some words will appear on the screen as well so yeah just encourage you to um, yeah take a deep breath and yeah pray this stuff um, together so as I enter prayer now I pause to be still to breathe slowly to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God Lord, in this busy season, please help us to be still. We're opening our ears now to hear you. Will you prepare our hearts for the wonder of your coming at Christmas? So now we're going to rejoice and reflect. And this is based on Psalm 33. We choose to rejoice in God's unfailing love today, joining in the ancient hope of all God's people. And this is, yes, Psalm 23. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. And we're going to have a look now at one of um, yeah, the prophetic parts of the Bible that was written ages and ages before Jesus actually came to earth. Um, and yeah, we're going to spend a bit of time in Isaiah 61. This is what it says. Can you imagine the scene from Luke 4:18? Jesus rocks up to the synagogue, gets up in front of the congregation, opens the scroll of the book of Isaiah, reads this passage, and then says... Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's a mic drop moment. And the crowd goes wild, but not in a good way. And these are the words that Jesus read. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And Isaiah 61, it's a messianic prophecy that speaks of a leader, the servant of the Lord who has an outstanding mandate, declaring good news and displaying the power of God through dramatic works of healing and deliverance. When Jesus claims that passage as his job description, his community was enraged Who does he think he is? So now we're going to ask, and we've got a couple of prayers to pray. God, would you help us bind up the brokenhearted when hearts are breaking all around us? 
in a time where our news feed is flooded with bad news, how might we both bring and be good news today? And Father, we pray for those right now who are captive in whatever way, whatever that looks like. Jesus, will you be good news to them? Will you bring freedom, complete freedom of body, soul and spirit and release them from darkness today? And so now we are going to yield. And as we return to the passage from Isaiah, um, yeah, we pray, Father, will you open our ears to hear your word and our hearts to yield to your will once again? So I'm going to read those verses from Isaiah again. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. But Jesus didn't have a Messiah complex. He actually was the fulfilment of this promise from Isaiah. He laid hold of this ancient prophecy and spent the rest of his life living into it. And he invites us to do the same. So here's a closing prayer. Father, help us live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. Um, yeah, so hopefully that was yeah a helpful thing to do. Um, again, I want to encourage you to check out that prayer app. Um, yeah, as you can see, it's a really kind of good way to focus, particularly in this season coming up to Christmas. So I'm going to hand over to Patrick Regan now. Um, as I said, Patrick heads up a charity called Kintsugi Hope, um, who yeah do some really good stuff around well-being. Um, and promoting uh, good mental health and how we can work that out together. Um, So, yeah, I'm going to hand over to Patrick now. It is so brilliant to be with you, uh, Ebenezer Church in Bristol. I have so much love and affirmation for you guys, and I think Stuart is a complete legend, and just so impressed the way that you constantly reach out to your community, how your generous Uh, uh, generosity and the way you are, the values you have. um, I really feel like you guys uh, have such similar DNA to us at Kintsugi. So happy Christmas to everyone at Ebenezer Bristol and uh, I'm really excited just to share this little message with you guys. Wow, I guess this isn't the type of Christmas that most of us expected. Um, This time last year, I'd never heard of uh, your mute. Or have you, have you forgotten your face mask? These things never even entered our head or our vocabulary. And there's been so much change in this year. But Christmas is uh, upon us. And, uh, and I know from us at Kintsugi Hope, we want to wish everyone listening to this a really, really happy Christmas. And uh, we, we, we really appreciate everyone's support. Uh, it's been so incredible this year. Kintsugi Hope's grown so much over the last year. There's now over 500 leaders, 180 churches running Kintsugi groups, uh, mostly on Zoom, but some face-to-face because they can count as a support group. And uh, so people are getting support in their emotional, mental health. About a third of the people in the groups uh, are from non-faith. And there's just been some 
beautiful stories. In fact, today I had a story about someone who was so low, um, lost job, low mood, um, having suicidal thoughts, and just going back to work because his confidence after six weeks of being in the group has um, just uh, skyrocketed. So it's really encouraging to see what God is doing at this really, really challenging time. And we also have just produced the Kintsugi baubles. Yes, they have hope written on them. I don't know if you can see that. Um, they're absolutely beautiful and uh, gold ribbon. Um, and if you want to get those, you can get them off the Kintsugi Hope website. They're obviously um, bespoke, individually made, and all the money goes back into the charity because at the moment... Um, for most charities, it's pretty tough because we've had to cancel virtually every event that we've got planned for the next six months to a year. So, so if you're interested, they say hope. They've got the Kintsugi ribbon, uh, beauty coming out of brokenness. And uh, so, yeah, do check those out and uh, support us if you can. Now, my favorite Christmas story is of a young boy who decided instead of writing to Santa, he was going to go and write to Jesus because he realized that Christmas is all about Jesus. And so he said, um, he wrote his letter, Dear Jesus, um, I've been a really, really good boy. Uh, and if I'm a really good boy for a whole year, please can I have a bike? And he went back and he thought, you know what? Being good for a whole year, that, that's pretty tough. I'm not sure I can do that. And so he, he rethought about it, screwed the letter up. And, uh, and then he wrote a second letter. Dear Jesus, if I am good for a whole week, please can I have a bike? And he's like, a week is a long time. I don't know if I can do that. So he thinks, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to go for the day. So he's like, dear Jesus, if I could be good for a, just a day, please can I have a bike? And then he was like, you know, a day is a long time. It's 24 hours. Maybe I should go for something less ambitious. And he just couldn't think what to do. So then he went downstairs. And downstairs in his house, they had like a wooden nativity. And he grabbed the Virgin Mary. And he took the statue of the Virgin Mary upstairs. And he stuck it in his bottom drawer and put some clothes over it. And then he got his pen and paper. And he said, dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mum again... Please, can I have a bike? Christmas is a time where we really start to think about kids and celebration, yet the first Christmas was incredibly different. Teenage pregnancy, refugees, power games, arguments over land, social injustice, poverty, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, exportation, dictatorship, oppression, uncertainty, fear, intimidation, not quite knowing what's going to happen, feeling on edge all the time. Actually, when I read those words, it doesn't sound dissimilar to some of the situations we're finding in the world today and some of the emotions that many of us are feeling today. So I wanted to talk just a little bit, is how can we have a mentally healthy Christmas? And I don't really come here as an expert uh, on this stuff. I come as a pilgrim of trying to work it out along with you guys, almost just wanting to be on the journey with you and uh, grappling with this stuff. And as I thought about how can we have a mentally healthy Christmas, I've got three words, and they all begin with C, like a very good preacher. Um, courage, compassion, and love. No, that's a joke. Sorry. <laughs> Courage, um, curiosity, and compassion. There you go. They actually all do begin with C. And the first one is courage. And, uh, and I'm just thinking about the amount of courage it took God to lay aside power and glory, to take his place amongst human beings who would greet him with skepticism, not knowing who he is. The Carol O'Neill Town of Bethlehem is one of my favorites. It had this line in it. The hopes and fears of all the years rest on thee tonight. You may have heard me say this before, that courage and vulnerability are the same thing. Vulnerability is never weakness. And it's really hard, isn't it, to think of an act of courage that doesn't involve vulnerability. 
Brene Brown, the famous research professor, says the Latin word for courage is cur. It means to speak your mind with your heart, to show up and let yourself be truly seen. And that's what we need this Christmas, actually. We need people to have courage to show up and, and when they're not doing very well, to say. You know, um, it is okay not to be okay. And God modeled vulnerability in an incredible way at Christmas by becoming a baby. The most powerful became a baby, born to a teenage couple in the midst of war and poverty. A baby. Anyone could hold a baby that couldn't control its own bladder. But you know, at Christmas, God had this idea of changing the world, not through power and strength, but through weakness and vulnerability. And he says, when you're weak, you're strong. And we know that the culture of the time, it was incredibly violent. And we know that the Jewish people, they just wanted to rule their own land. They just wanted the Romans to go. And the Romans were ruling at the point of the sword. And what people wanted is they wanted a violent revolution. They wanted a Messiah to come and to, to see off the Romans. Christmas was a time of revolution, but it was a revolution of love. It's a revolution where a new kind of justice was born. A place where the poor and the broken and the marginalized would suddenly take center stage. This idea of vulnerability being um, not being weakness is a really interesting one. And, you know, I remember listening to Brene Brown do her famous TED talk on this. And, uh, and she said she did this exercise where she asked people to finish the sentence, vulnerability is. And uh, she came up with all these sort of things. I thought, yeah. I think that would work in America, I can see that. I wonder if it would work in the UK. So before one of my talks on everyone's chair, I literally put vulnerability is typed out and a pen. And, and I said, you know, just while you're waiting for me to start speaking, please just, if you want to, just um, fill out that little bit of sheet and just let me know what you think vulnerability is. And, uh, and I published what they said in, in the book, you may have seen this, When Faith Gets Shaken. And uh, this is what they said. Vulnerability is letting other people and God see your heart. Vulnerability is living how God created you to live, not how your friends want you to live. Vulnerability is taking a step of faith without knowing where it would lead. Vulnerability is being the one to stand up for prayer when no one around has stood up. Vulnerability is trusting God. Vulnerability is allowing yourself to face the pain of abuse and refusing to let it define your future. Vulnerability is, is when you let the people see the real you, the person behind all the barriers. Vulnerability is allowing others to share your burdens with you. Vulnerability is admitting to self-harming to your closest friends and family. Vulnerability is not being afraid to have an opinion. Vulnerability is standing by your brother's bed, having been told he's going to die, yet believing God has the power to heal, so hoping and praying for that healing. Vulnerability is letting people see you cry. Vulnerability is looking in the mirror and not trying to change what you see. I think that one is incredible. This Christmas, we need courage. We need vulnerability. Jesus was born away from home, no midwife, no family present, in a dark cave in Bethlehem. Philip Yancey says this, Today, as I read the account of Jesus' birth, I tremble to think of the fate of the world resting on the response of two rural teenagers. Please, we need to have courage. Courage and vulnerability are the same thing. The second C is curiosity. I think at Christmas is a time of incredible pressure, actually. It can be a time of immense pressure where our minds just feel so clouded. The reality is before COVID-19, um, these stats are from 2014, so they were a long time ago. It, and the stats were from MIND, 21,000 people spent Christmas in hospital as being unwell due to mental health illness which means thousands of families spent Christmas um, with someone not there who should have been there. Um, Mind's poll revealed that 76 people had problems sleeping at Christmas. 60% had experienced 
panic attacks over the Christmas period. And the reasons people gave for struggling at Christmas included going into debt, 41%. Uh, 83% felt lonely. And uh, 81 said Christmas is just too stressful. The reality is, is there are so many plates to spin. And sometimes it can feel really, really hard. And so we can start feeling really negative about ourselves. And so my thing about curiosity is get curious about why you're thinking the way you're thinking. So if I could give you one piece of advice around thinking, it's this. Don't believe everything you think. Your mind isn't always your friend. You know, um, you may have heard me use this illustration before. Is um, If you can imagine your thoughts as trains coming into a railway station, like the underground, for instance. And, uh, you know, you can let that train come. And, you know, sometimes people say, if you get a negative thought, you just need to rebuke it in the name of Jesus and smash it with a few Bible verses. Well, the reality is, we all know, the more you try and think about something, what happens? The more, you don't tr- you know, the more you don't try to think about something, what happens? You think about it, don't you? You think about it even more. You know, I try and do it, like, now. I don't want to think about chocolate, and uh, I'm finding that quite hard. And the thing is, is you can go to that train. You're not coming here in the name of Jesus. The train's going to come in every two minutes. What taking captive every thought means is it means that you stand there and you decide not to get on the train. You decide not to let the train take you into that dark, dark place where it's it's really desperate and isolating, and particularly at Christmas time. Or if you get in there and you start thinking negatively, get off at the next station. And, uh, And so it's a very short thing. You know, it's the reality is, is your mind isn't always your friend. Susan David, who's become a little bit more of a hero of mine, she wrote a book called Emotional Agility, and, uh, and she talks about that, that our emotions are really, really important data that tells us often something is wrong. But emotional agility is the pause when we get curious about what they're trying to tell us and how we should respond. It's a bit like, if you imagine a chessboard, um, sometimes you can see yourself as one uh, piece on the chessboard with one option, one move. Or you can take the bigger look and see the bigger picture and realize as you look at the chessboard, there are lots of possible moves. There isn't just one option. You are not just a piece on the chessboard. And uh, emotional agility recognizes emotion as important signs and uh, it allows us to examine the emotions uh, rather than responding straight away. We can make decisions about the way we want to react that will lead us to the life that we wanted. Emotional agility for me is around getting comfortable being uncomfortable. It's realizing that actually life isn't brilliant, and that's okay. I love this quote from Susan David. I think it's beautiful. It says this, Life's beauty is inseparable from its frailty. One of the greatest human triumphs is to choose to make room in our hearts for both joy and pain. And to get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's what getting curious is all about. Is realizing that our thoughts don't have to be our friends all the time. You know, we have to be able to get curious about what we're thinking about and ask ourselves why. uh, Particularly when it's really pressured at Christmas time. And then the third C is compassion. And uh, I remember when I was going through a really tough time, I went to this counsellor and uh, explaining all the things I had to do and the reasons why I wasn't doing good enough and I wasn't enough and, you know, I should be okay, I ought to be better, or I must be stronger and had to pull myself together and, you know, why am I moaning when there's so many other people that got so much worse off than me and, and all this sort of stuff and gave me this massive list. And she said, I think, Patrick, you need to show yourself some self-compassion. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really into bubble baths and candles, you know. And and she looked at me, she was like, "Mm, I think you've misunderstood what self-compassion is. Because self-compassion is talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. It's treating yourself with kindness. It's not about giving yourself endless pleasure 
more biscuits, more wine. In fact, many of the ways we show kindness to ourselves make us feel guilty in the long run and actually could be quite dangerous. True compassion, talking to yourself the way you would talk to your best friend. What does your friend need? Well, your friend who's struggling probably needs encouragement, understanding, empathy, patience, and gentleness. So often we say things to ourselves that we would never dream of saying to someone we don't even like, not alone someone we love. Compassion actually means, um, throughout the Bible, it means to suffer with, um, to be conscious of another's distress and to have that desire to alleviate the pain. So self-compassion means being able to do that for yourself. I remember when I was having a particularly bad day, my friend sent me a text and, uh, well, it was like a WhatsApp and it said this on it, note to self, the plan is this, you do what you can, when you can, however you can, whatever you've got and if you can't, you can't, you rest until you can again, you give yourself kindness so your pockets are full and you can reach in and pull out a fistful to offer folks you meet along the way. Self-compassion isn't taking the easy way out. It's giving ourselves kindness so we can give kindness to others. And, you know, I don't know what it is, but at Christmas, that inner critic, you know, I often um, try and imagine what my inner critic looks like. What does my inner critic sound like? Um, But it seems to be louder. You know, uh, it says, um, you've got to try harder. You've got to be better. You've got to be all things to all people. We've got to listen to an alternative voice. How about this for an alternative voice at Christmas? Let me be an alternative voice for you. You're doing the best you can. Making a mistake doesn't make you human. Struggling doesn't mean you fail. It makes you a human being. No one is perfect. It's okay not to be okay all the time. It's also okay that not everyone likes you. Everyone is allowed a bad day. Accept your limitations. You know, sometimes I think in the past, with um, particularly in Christian culture, we've sort of had this sense that we have to sacrifice everything. And don't get me wrong, I hope that um, I'm self-sacrificial in my life. But I remember bouncing around to songs like History Makers and Gonna Change the World. And, and I love those songs in some ways. But I've got to realize that actually it's Jesus who's the hero, it's not me. It's Jesus who's the rescuer, it's not me. It's about pointing people to Jesus because otherwise we just burn ourselves out trying to do everything. And the whole image of Kintsugi is saying that beauty comes out of brokenness. You know, a beautiful building, 2 Corinthians, that talks about um, treasures, uh, in j- um, treasures in jars of clay. You know, it, it's a beautiful thing that the, the, the pots were, were made to be fragile. They were made to be broken. So when you put the light in, the light can shine through the cracks. And it is weird, isn't it? We're made to be fragile. We're made to be vulnerable. We're made to be human, to share in that. To, because if we're broken, what it says is actually there's more chance of God um, using us because we don't get in the way. So this Christmas, please remember the three C's. Um, courage, curiosity, compassion. Because Christmas is a time where God decided, you know what, I'm going to get involved so people know that they're never on their own. Often people say the most common question you get is where is God where they're suffering? Well, Christmas is the answer. He hears the cries of his people and decides to get involved, not from a distance, but as a human being, to bring a revolution of love, a revolution of kindness. Archbishop Desmond Tutu says this, God calls us to be his partners to a work of a new kind of society where people count, where people matter more than things, more than possessions, where human life is not just respected but positively revered where people count, will be secure and not suffer from the fear of hunger, from ignorance, from disease, where there'll be more gentleness, more caring, more sharing, more compassion, more laughter, where there's peace and not war. Jesus became a refugee on the run in Africa, where so many refugees are today, because he wanted to bring a revolution of love and compassion. One of my uh, favorite stories, um, you may have heard it, was uh, in the war, there was a group of um, French soldiers and uh, their, um, their, their colleague died. 
and they really wanted to give him a Christian burial. And, uh, and so they found this church, and uh, outside this church there was a big graveyard, and there was a big white fence that went round the graveyard. And uh, they knocked on the sort of vicar's door, and this, this priest came to the door, and they said, look, our, our friends died in battle, can we bury him in the graveyard? And the vicar was like, oh, I'm really sorry, there's, there's no room. You can't bury him inside the graveyard. You can't bury him inside the white fence. And, uh, and they, were, they were devastated. And yet it, they were tired. Um, so they buried him just outside the white fence. They buried him just outside the graveyard and they paid their respects. And uh, they went back to the camp. The next day, um, they had new orders to go to somewhere else. And they, they said, we just want to go and say goodbye to our friends. So they ran to the church and they tried to find the grave. And they couldn't find the grave that they dug um, anywhere. So they knocked on the, the parish priest's door again and they said, look, we were here last night. We're sorry to disturb you, but we buried our friend outside the white fence. And the parish priest looked at them and went, I know. And last night I couldn't sleep. It just felt wrong. So I got up and I moved the fence. So your friend is now buried inside the graveyard. When Jesus came, he came not just to move a fence, he came to smash it to pieces. He came that there'd be no barriers anymore between us and God. Emmanuel, God with us. And that's the message of hope. Philip Yancey, um, a brilliant author, says, if I could describe Christmas in words, I would describe it as humility. God became human. I'd describe it as the underdog because actually, you know what? Being a refugee in that culture was pretty tough. What he had to go through, what Mary and Joseph and all the challenges that they had to go through. Vulnerability, we've already talked about this tiny little baby here to change the world. And lastly, involved. God came because he wanted to get involved. Silent night, holy night, a night that changed the world. So this Christmas, let's hold on to that message. Let's show courage and vulnerability. Let's get curious when all the pressure comes. And let's actually show compassion. Because Jesus didn't come to beat us up. He came because he wanted to take our burden. You know, it's where it says, you know, I come because um, I want you to cast your burdens onto me. He never says, you know, you're stupid for having burdens. Actually, it's part of life. We have them. But he's talking about casting them on you, on him not to make you feel guilty for it. May God bless you, and I hope you have a fantastic Christmas. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, some really, really good stuff for us to be um, thinking about and taking on. And, yeah, I want to encourage you um, to keep mulling this stuff over. Um, it can be quite easy, can't it, to we press stop on our video, we switch off our TV, however you're watching this, and, um, yeah, kind of forget about it, but... Yeah, as Patrick said, our well-being is so, so important. And yeah, whether it is stuff to do with having courage to be vulnerable or the curiosity and taking on what, you, what you're feeling and why you might be feeling it or, um, yeah, that compassion, um, particularly like self-compassion, isn't it? It's so important um, at any time, but I think especially at this time of the year, in this time that we yeah show ourselves some self-compassion that we're kind to ourselves um there's a lot of stuff going on right now um and yeah maybe what patrick has said has kind of thrown up a lot of stuff with you and you don't know where to go with it um yeah we would love to pray with you and that's not necessarily very easy to do but is possible do yeah get in touch with us let us know how we can be doing that um yeah we want to work this stuff out together as church family or if you're not part of church family yeah just as a community together um it's really important that we support each other in this um so i'm gonna hand over to Stu now who's gonna um yeah lead us in some worship and just want to encourage you to um yeah keep responding keep listening to what god might be saying to you as we um yeah worship together You were the word at the beginning 
One with God, the Lord knows Him glory in creation Now revealed in you Beautiful name it is Beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ Beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. Beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without Jesus. Greater love was greater. What can separate us now? Wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. Name of Jesus Christ, my name. Wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. Wonderful name it is. Wonderful name it is the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, they'll talk before you, silence the boast of sin and grace. Heavens are roaring, praise of your glory, for you are in. Father God, thank you, um, yeah, for what Christmas is all about. That, um, yeah, like Patrick said, the barriers between us and you are gone because Jesus came here to earth as a baby and, yeah, how the rest of the story unfolds. So, um, yeah, thank you that you are an up-close and personal God, that you, you hear our cries, you celebrate the good stuff with us that yeah you want to be a part of the whole of life and yeah father i pray where again still life is all up in the air and we might not know what the next few weeks are going to look like we might not know how christmas is going to look like um yeah thank you god that you are the same yesterday today tomorrow yeah father we help us to trust you 
Yeah, thank you for your love for every single one of us. Yeah, watching and listening wherever we are. Yeah, I pray, Father God, we will continue to hear you speak to us over these next few weeks, that we will see you in all the stuff of life. And yeah, as we focus on Christmas, yeah, I pray that we will hear that story afresh. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, or whatever day, time it is for you. Um, yeah, we would love to have you involved in our other Christmas services. As, as I said, please do come along, invite anyone and everyone. Um, yeah, it would be really good um, to do Christmas together as much as we can. Uh, so every uh, Sunday after our service, we have a Zoom catch-up. That's just a, a bit of space to um, see people, to find out how um, our weeks have gone, what's going on in life. Um, so yeah, if you would like to do that, please yeah, join us. doesn't matter if you're not usually a part of church, um, family here, or um, if you've never done it before, um, there will be a link on the screen. Otherwise, um, take care, have a great rest of the day, week, and um, we will see you very soon. Take care. <laughs>